most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for Your blessings. We're thankful again for the opportunity to look into Your Word. We pray that we be presented in truth and received as such. Pray that, uh, we pray that we'll truly worship Thee in spirit and in truth. Lord, that You bless in such a way that uh, Your people will be strengthened, edified, and Lord, if it's in Your will, Others may come to know you as their Savior and be added to the church. Our Father, we ask thy blessings upon those who cannot be here. Lord, there are some who are away because of distance, some because of sickness, others uh, maybe because of other reasons. Lord, thou knowest the need of each one. We pray that you'll just bless in a way that they'll be able to be with us the next appointed time if it's in your will. We ask that you just lead, guide, and direct us in all things. Lord, give me unction from on high, Lord, that, uh, uh, you're, you're, that, that, that our Savior be high and lifted up, Lord, and that uh, you would uh, help us to uh, help your word, that it will find a lodging place in our hearts and our minds. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. John chapter 4 will read a, a lengthy passage for our text, but we'll begin reading at verse 1. John chapter 4, beginning at verse 1, it says, When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee, and he must needs go through Samaria. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria, and drew water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Jesus saith unto her, Go call thy husband, and come hither. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. In that saidst thou truly. The woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men 
ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye, ye worship ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. And when this came, and upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with the woman, yet no man said, What seekest thou? Or why talkest thou with her? The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and saith to the men, Come, see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? This is, of course, a very magnificent story, a great account of what happened there that day when Jesus had to, must needs, go through Samaria. He had an appointment to meet up with that Samaritan woman there at the well. A lot of things could be said, a lot of things could be preached from this passage, and I have preached from this before. But today I want to preach a message on the subject of some truths about worship. And actually, this is going to be a series of messages, I believe, about the subject of worship. Uh, and the only way that we can learn about worship is through the Scriptures. We can only find out about worship uh, from the Lord. We'll take our text from verse 24. He says, God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. The word worship is used frequently today. It's thrown around very often in our vocabulary here in America. Uh, and quite f frequently in Christian circles. Sometimes you'll hear of worship courses, you'll hear of worship teams, worship manuals, worship seminars, you'll hear the word worship often. Uh, the basic meaning though of worship is oftentimes misused, sometimes it is totally lost in our vocabulary. And uh, I got to thinking about this subject, though, whenever I was asked a question. It was a simple question, but it was a question nonetheless. And that is, the question was, and it came to me several weeks ago, and I've been pondering it. I thought, man, this would make a great sermon, a great article, a great discussion topic, whatever. But the, the question was, why does God need to be worshipped? Why does God need to be worshipped? And people will sometimes ask that question or maybe some similar question. And any time that you get asked a question like that, you really need to ask another question, another question before you get to the answer. And that question should be, what do you mean by that? Uh, particularly, what do you mean by God? Uh, because... Depending on who's asking the question, they may not mean the same God that we worship. And uh, then you might want to follow it up with, what do you mean by worship? Uh, because you all may not be on the same page, you and the person who's asking the question. And so really, words do mean things, but sometimes you and the person you're talking to, 
they may not mean the same thing. Uh, I find that to be true a lot of times whenever you whenever you're talking to people, especially you know not to pick on them too much, but it, but they're an easy target because oftentimes they'll come knocking on your door. But the Watchtower Witnesses, they often will use the same terminology that we do. They will use the word Bible, but their Bible is much different than ours. Uh, and uh, certainly, uh, if you don't believe me, you can, you can ask to borrow their Bible or get a copy of it, and you can go to just a couple pages back and... Uh, and John 1 and verse 1, their translation is very, very different than, than any other translation of the Bible. Uh, so the King James translation says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Their translation, and I've seen it, I've borrowed their Bible, I've looked at it. Their translation says, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. That little difference makes all the difference in the world. So not only is their Bible a different Bible when they say Bible, but guess what else is different? When they say Jesus, their Jesus is a different Jesus. Because if Jesus was a God, He's not the God, is He? And so words do mean things when you're talking to people. And so when somebody comes up and asks a question like, why does God need to be worshipped? We need to start out before we answer the question, what do you mean by God? And what do you mean by worship? Assuming that by saying God... The person asking the question means the God of the Bible and no other God. And assuming that person is indeed of like faith, that they're speaking the same spiritual language as us, then the conversation is very, very easy. Otherwise, then we've got to then we've got to break some ground, don't we? We've got some opportunity to witness. We've got some opportunity to really preach some gospel. Let them know about the God of the Bible. Introduce them to the God of the Bible. And we'll get into that here in just a moment. But what is it to worship? Well, the word worship very simply in our... English, uh, if you look it up, it's uh, the etymology of the word comes to us from the Anglo-Saxons, uh, worth-ship. Pretty interesting study there. It means homage, the attitude and activity designed to recognize and describe the worth of the person, the God or the thing to which the homage is addressed. In the Greek, according to Vines, Used in our text, it means very similar, to make obeisance, to do reverence to. And uh, that's, why, that's why I don't like to be called reverend. Holy and reverend is his name, not mine. We might use the word in different ways in our vocabulary. We might talk about the form of church service. We might say the worship service. We might talk about family worship. Sometimes we might hear folks talk about someone who really likes a, likes a person. We might say that they worship the ground that she walks on. We hear those things, people talking about like that. We might see evidence of false worship. Actually, we see it all the time. We just don't catch on to it. We see it in movies, we see it on TV, uh, we, see, we see it in, uh, even in cartoons a lot of times. 
Disney Disney likes to throw those things in there a lot uh, in their movies and cartoons and then we see it in the in the popular films and so on sometimes we might even see it at the ball games some people get so into their team they really begin to worship their favorite ball players or their favorite teams I submit to you today though that much of the world is no different than this poor lady there that Jesus was talking to verse 22 he says ye worship ye know not what you worship ye know not what no different than her or even no different than the Athenians actually I I believe that the world is much closer to the Athenians in Acts chapter 17 Acts chapter 17 and beginning verse 16 now while Paul waited for them at Athens Acts 17 verse 16 his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Here's Paul in the midst of a people full of worshipers. Understand that for a moment. But his spirit was moved within him because they were worshiping the wrong things. Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and the Stoics encountered him and some said, What will this babbler say? Others some, He seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection and they took him and brought him unto Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is. For thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. We would know, therefore, what these things mean. For the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship him, declare I unto you. So here's Paul, he's in this place. He sees the idolatry all around them, these false worshipers. His spirit is moved within him. And daily... Daily, in the synagogue, with the Jews, with the devout persons, in the market, wherever he's at, he doesn't seem to take any time off. He's finding opportunity to witness to people. He's spending his time reasoning, witnessing, giving an answer to these folks. I'm sure that every night when he pillowed himself down, he was exhausted. But every morning when he got back up, he got at it again. Why? Because his spirit was moved. He had a concern for the people around him. This is faith in action. This is, this is a concern for souls in action. Pay attention to people. Notice what they're what they're worshiping, notice what they're doing, notice the idolatry around you, and get stirred, and, 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 and do something about it. But notice the people there 
They were interested in hearing or telling some new thing. Remind you of anything? Yeah, it reminds me of the warning that we read about in the last sermon last week when I preached about a call to study. Remember the warning? If you hold your place there in Acts 17 and go to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 14. Ephesians 4 and verse 14, he says, That we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Carried about with every wind of doctrine. Here's a group of people who were actually excited to catch on to every wind of doctrine, every wind of new thing, whatever it is. They wanted to hear about it, they wanted to grab hold of it, and they wanted to learn about it. They had nothing to anchor their souls in, nothing to anchor their teaching in. Philosophers, the Epicureans, the Stoics, the wise men of the day, they heard of Paul and they said, man, he's a babbler, but we want to hear him. They're kind of making fun of him. But they said, we'll hear him. What's this wise guy got to say? He ain't smart like us, but he's a setter forth of new things. He's a setter forth of strange gods. What is this Jesus he's preaching? Resurrection? Let's hear it. Bring him in. They took him and brought him to the Areopagus. Tell us about this new doctrine. You've brought strange things to our ears and we want, we want to know about it. These guys, they spent all their time hearing and telling some new thing. And as Paul stood there in Mars Hill, he said, I found an altar with the inscription to the unknown God. I'm going to tell you about him because you're ignorantly worshiping him. You don't even know what you're worshiping, but I'm going to tell you about him. And that's the state of the people in most of the world today. Because remember Romans chapter 1 and verse 20? We've looked at it before, but let's look at it again. Romans 1 and verse 20 tells us this. For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. The world is without excuse. But the man who only has the dim light of creation will only know that there is a creator. He'll only know that he's eternal, that he's powerful, He's mighty, but that's all he'll know. He won't know his name. He won't know how to worship him. He won't know about the, the redemption plan. He'll have no clue about those things unless someone tells him through the preaching of the Word of God. God could have very easily commissioned the birds to fly around and sing the gospel message. But he didn't do it. He could have written it out in the clouds or carved it into the mountains. But he didn't do it. In Romans chapter 10, this is what, this is what, he, this is what we find. Romans chapter 10... For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. 
For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe on him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And evangelism is just that. It's work. It's work. It's not just boxing up Bibles and sending them out to the world. It, if that's all it's took, why not just... Go out in an airplane and drop leaflets down over the jungle. Just hang up scripture signs out in your front yard and say, That's, I've done my duty. In Acts chapter 8, Acts chapter 8, you've got the Ethiopian eunuch. Verse 30 says, And Philip ran thither to him, heard him read the prophet Isaiah, and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I, except some man should guide me? He desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture which he read was thus. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation, for his life is taken from the earth? And the eunuch answered Philip, and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or of some man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. One of the plainest scriptures in all of the Old Testament this eunuch was reading, and he didn't understand it until the preacher showed up and explained it to him and preached to him Jesus. The lost man does not understand the words of the scriptures, even when they are very plain. And so it's no wonder that whenever you look out at the world, there is some off-the-wall, off-the-wall, unscriptural worship going on. Some of it is pure out rebellion against God. We find that examples of that in the Bible. When when you go back to the Old Testament and you read of you you read of people rebelling against God, you that sort of thing is still going on today. But other of it is just plain out ignorance. They don't know because they've never read their Bibles. When you look out at the world, you find some folks who have never had a Bible, so they don't know. They don't know. You got people that do some crazy things in the name of worship. They sacrifice humans and do all sorts of things. They don't know because they never have seen a Bible. They don't know what they're doing. So, when it comes to the question, why does God need to be worshipped? Again, words do mean things. And that word need is a mighty big word. Mighty big, big word. But we're talking about a mighty big God. And the question is, what does God need from man? What does God need from angels? He does not need anything from us. But 
before any of us existed, there was God. He is a self-sufficient being, needs nothing from without himself to support himself. He needs nothing from us to make him happy. He is the first as well as the last. There were no gods before him, and there will be none after him. From everlasting to everlasting, the Bible tells us He is God. And so let us, let us remember that we need Him in everything. In Acts chapter 17, Acts chapter 17 and verse 25 Verse 24, 25. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that He is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hand, hands, as though He needed anything, seeth He giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. Then he says that if they should seek the Lord, if hap haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. And certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Our very breath we breathe, we got from God. We need Him. He doesn't need us. And so then that brings the question. When we think of it that way, why do we need to worship Him? And so, Lord willing, next time, we'll look at it from that angle. May the Lord bless you with this message. Brother Isaiah, would you please dismiss us in prayer?